Hello and welcome to a very special interview on Bar and Bench with the man who penned the dissenting judgment in the NJAC case. He was also one of very few judges to speak up openly about the problems plaguing the system while still in office. Yes, you guessed it right. We are here to interview Justice Chalameshwar and find out his views on a number of issues ranging from what is plaguing the system to post-retirement jobs for judges. Let's go in and find out more. So your father was a lawyer in the district court. Did this have any bearing on you choosing to pursue law as a career? Actually, my father didn't really practice for a long time. He hardly practiced for five, six years. He stopped attending the course thereafter. Actually, it was my maternal grandfather who was uh, a successful lawyer uh, at Maslupatan. A kind of a local legend those days. Maybe it's his, his influence on me more than on the other hand, my father was uh, totally against my becoming a lawyer. Why is that, sir? I don't know. Unfortunately, he's not. Well, in fact, he didn't speak to me for one full year after I joined the law college. So, can you tell us a little bit about your early years as a lawyer, fresh out of law school? Well, I started my career in Dr. Bhimraz's office, who was a public prosecutor those days. He lived in the next lane, very next parallel lane. By an accident or uh, fit, my career started and ended with criminal law, my career in the courts. I started my practice in the PP's office. The last two judgments I opened in the Supreme Court were uh, criminal cases. Then uh, after some time, Dr. Bhim Razu laid down the office and he also declared retirement. He was not, uh, not very, health-wise he was not very good those days. He suffered a heart attack. So he advised me to go and get into some other office uh, because he was retiring. Then I shifted to let's be Raja Rao's office, who was a government leader those days. So I was with him for three, three and a half years. I was with him. That's about the beginning of my professional career. So how did those early days treat you, sir? Uh, were you making enough to make ends meet? Well, uh, for any lawyer, average lawyer in this country, the early days are the same. But then, uh, I was very enthusiastic. And financially, I was really not uh, in need of making money from the profession at that point of time. I could survive even without any income from the profession. So, a lot of um, lawyers romanticize the good old days. Uh, what do you think has changed? Well, I would like to add the adjectives good or bad uh, old days, but the days were different certainly. The reason, I mean, uh, one could write a whole thesis on what happened, what are the changes and why they, why they occurred. I think it's a one-liner, uh, it can't be explained. Broadly speaking, I can tell you this. It was a profession those days. Somehow, of an uncomfortable feeling, uh, it's becoming uh, trade now. Right. Why would you say that, sir? The amount of uh, money that's flowing in the profession, I'm not uh, against anybody making money. But then, at least, first of all, there is a huge uh, disparity between very successful lawyers and not very successful lawyers. Some of these very successful lawyers at the Delhi, Delhi level make more money than successful film stars, Amitabh Bachchan and Rajani Kant. They make more money. And then most of the other lawyers uh, hardly make uh, one hundredth of what they make. And I'm not talking about those who are uh, not competent enough to make that, that much of money. But there are people who are uh, fairly competent, but at the same time, they are not able to. Why it happens is a different story. I am not on that. But when I hear that uh, somebody is charging a crore of rupees per day, uh, 
it certainly i don't feel very pleasant about it no actually who's paying them might be willing to pay them i am i'm not quarreling with uh, the thing or uh, i'm not uh, uh, objecting to anybody making but at that level it ceases to be a profession according to me traditionally i suppose you know the barristers never uh, stipulated the fee what of the client used to put in the pouch they used to carry what of the client used to put in the pouch from there uh, things have changed they are good or bad they are good old days or bad old days well, it's a matter of opinion i don't want to be judgment about things have changed so we always inclined towards becoming a judge what no i never planned to become a judge in the sense i just wanted to be a lawyer judgeship was something uh, it was an accident when the invitation came in 97 uh, i just consulted a couple of elders mm-hmm. one of them advised uh, it's a call of duty you must you must not reject it then i accepted it were there any questions in your mind when you were offered judgeship was was there any conflict were you, did you seriously consider not accepting the position not seriously consider uh, not to accept it Uh, but I was not very sure whether I should accept it because first of all, by standards of South India, I was uh, relatively young when the offer came. I was 44, and honestly, I didn't really make uh, big money in the profession by then. Those days, this kind of money was not there. It was just enough to survive. I'm sure I would have made a little more money if I didn't accept the position. i really didn't know how it would be as i told you i consulted a couple of elders so could you tell us a little bit about your time as chief justice of the guwahati and kerala high courts how was that for you how was it moving away from the andhra pradesh high court to another high court and taking well, charge of it i had very pleasant time at both the places i had no difficulty in either of the high courts one problem in this uh, country is when you become a judge in your own parent high court you are uh, you are assessed not on the basis uh, completely on your performance but a lot of other factors go into making an assessment of uh, how good a, or how bad a judge x is because you have your own friends you have your own doubtful friends here in your parent court and you have uh, people who perhaps are not very appreciative of you there are people who suspect you that uh, you slipped into the office for extraneous reasons all these speculations are always, I mean, the, these speculations are always there about everybody even the greatest whom we consider to be greatest today when their own time these speculations were there i don't know whether you are aware of it when jesus krishna had became a judge of the supreme court it was not received very well people thought he was smuggled into the supreme court because of his political uh, philosophy some reason well, uh, this is the story with reference to every judge about every judge there will be some speculation about all those things so do you agree with the philosophy that uh, a chief justice of a high court should not be from the same state do you think that makes no, sense no i do i don't agree with it i don't agree with the philosophy part of it i said how you asked me the first question how was your experience there i said i have i had a very good personal I had a very good experience. I had a pleasant time, but as a policy, whether it is right, I I I don't agree that it is a good policy. That uh, the chief justice should not be from the same state. You think that's not? Yeah, this transfer policy. policy, in my view, simply didn't uh, help the system, not the people. Now, how do you help? You, I'll tell you. The average tenure of a chief justice in this uh, chief justice of a high court in this country, average, is about a year. Year. I was one of those exceptional cases. Uh, I was there for four and a half years as chief justice of two years, but average is about a year. Now, uh, if somebody goes out of his home state to become the chief justice of another state or another high court, because some state, some high courts have more than one state within their jurisdiction, it so happened in my case. When I went to Guwahati, it was a court of seven states. Totally. Uh, a different uh, atmosphere 
to get acquainted with the local, uh, like the names of the judges, everything about the place, the local uh, practices, all these things take some time. To get acquainted uh, with the faces of the judicial officers who are uh, administratively subordinate to the High Court, the Chief Justice is supposed to have some uh, idea about them, their performance. All this takes time. And by the time the Chief Justice learns all these things, he is al almost on the verge of retirement or about to pack his bags and push off either to the Supreme Court or home. One of the things. So there is one problem. Second is, look at the system now. When this transfer policy was not there, a judge would become the Chief Justice in his own parent high court if he has sufficiently long service and as and when he becomes the senior most judge, senior judge of that court, as and when the Chief Justice is retired, the senior most judge used to become the Chief Justice. Very, very rare exception that the senior most judge was not made the Chief Justice of high court. But now what happens, uh, from some high courts you have three, four chief justices simultaneously. Some high courts don't get a representation at all as a chief justice. They are always because of the transfer policy. And these in turn, uh, what happens, uh, if there are two or three chief justices from a particular high court at a given point of time, all of them would uh, get into the zone of consideration for elevation to the Supreme Court. And that is a wonderful system. These are the, uh, hardly anybody asks what judgment uh, a particular judge wrote and how good the judgment was. Seniority, uh, essentially a bureaucratic norm, seniority. But then that's crept into the Indian judiciary, even at the highest level, people talk about seniority. I am senior than uh, so on, so therefore I should be considered. It creates an imbalance of sorts. Yeah. It created a lot of problems. I'll tell you one uh, latest deadlock in the country, I don't know whether you people have noticed it or not. Until the current acting Chief Justice of Bombay High Court moves out of that court now, I believe she is scheduled to go to Madras. Madras. Nobody could be posted to Bombay High Court because she is the senior most in all India seniority. No judge could be posted to Bombay. Because they would be subordinate to her in terms uh, of all India seniority. Junior to her in all India seniority. Or in seniority. That is another norm. Normally, we are, the system has not yet uh, come to the stage where. Juniors are made the chief justices of seniors. Well, all this happened because of the transfer policy. Somewhere it bomb happened with all this thing. It happened. We couldn't simply, at least so long as I was there, I know what happened. Because of this problem, we couldn't uh, decide, I mean, we couldn't send anybody to Bombay as chief justice. Because there was no senior judge available, uh, who was senior, no judge available who was senior to just Al Ramani. So that brings me to my next question. So you were part of the Collegium for a considerable period of time. Can you take us through what happens in such a meeting? A lot of people don't know what happens behind those closed doors. How do you actually decide that someone is fit to become a judge of the Supreme Court? Why don't you ask the sitting judges of the Collegium? Why are you asking me today? See, I'll tell you, a lot of desirable and undesirable things also happen. Some exercise is done as to who should be. But this is more of a clerical exercise, who is senior, who is junior, who would put into, this is purely a clerical uh, affair. Coming to the uh, appointment of judges, if it, judges uh, to the Supreme Court is, is one matter, one thing and judges to the High Court is a different matter. When you are choosing judges to the Supreme Court, if the system really wants, at least there is a possibility of having some objective criteria, like what judgments uh, particular judge wrote, how sound is his jurisprudential background. These are the matters which could be verified. When you are looking at elevating a judge to the High Court? High Court. The inevitable considerations, of course, since it is a federal uh, democratic society, legitimately the units expect uh, a due representation to you. More particularly when I have a Supreme Court with 31 judges. When I, when I had a Supreme Court with seven judges, this question of regional representation or state-wise uh, representation didn't come. With 31 seats, certainly every state expects they lay a claim subject to all those uh, expectations. The suitability of an individual is the next this thing. So are you saying that representation takes precedence over 
the suitability of an individual? Well, that, that, that does. Isn't that a I don't, I, see, I'm already on record. See, these things in a system, well, no system is perfect. A system run by human beings, there are always operations. These rules have been invoked conveniently. There is an old saying in Andhra Pradesh High Court, maybe many other High Courts also. That is this I have heard ever since I got into the profession in Andhra Pradesh. They show you, show me the man, I'll show you the rule. If I want to take somebody, I'll 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 use the rule of all India seniority. If I don't want to take somebody, I'll take the rule of uh, representation to the particular high court. Well, they are con very conveniently invoked. A point. What I said is, we require a more transparent system. Please, let's let's record the reasons. So all deliberations must mm. be put out, not yeah. just. The decisions taken and we, we, we say no. I simply don't like uh, Warren's face and uh, nobody says I don't like. Uh, no, no, no. I don't think he's fit to come. Why? Why do you think that he is not fit to come to Supreme Court or come to High Court? You want that to be recorded as well? Yes. You, you may be right. There's a person who is giving an opinion that uh, Charan Shri is not fit to become a High Court judge or a Supreme Court judge. Maybe right. But then please give me reasons. Why do you think so? Charan uh, knowledge of law is deficient. Or he speaks bad English, or uh, he doesn't uh, dress up properly, or he's a, he's a integrity is questionable. Or integrity is questionable is a very very valid consideration, provided you have some tangible material. You can if you want to condemn somebody, he can easily say, "Look here, I doubt his integrity." Every doubt uh, can't be this thing. So that is a very favorite pastime uh, of uh, those who want to create mischief. Because it's an easy thing. And in this country, the minute somebody says, I doubt somebody is integrity because of what is happening all around, immediately it will catch up like wildfire. So, point is, all right, if you suspect somebody's integrity, be bold to put it on record and give some, I am not asking for 100% proof, but some material to indicate that you have your doubt is justifiable. Even then, should it be rejected or should the fact be verified is the next question. That's a different matter. But at least that should be recorded. You gave a few meetings uh, a miss. Hmm. Not a miss. I officially announced I am not returning. I, I gave communicated in writing to the Chief Justice. Why was that? Because yeah. of this. Because nothing. Decisions were taken without any discussion. And nobody, somebody says, I don't like uh, this man. I want this man to be transferred. I said, why? You don't give reasons. And nobody talks about it. You know, you kind of, know, I don't want to offend you, therefore I agree with you. And then this is no fair system. There is no point in attending, attending this kind of a meeting. It is only a matter of adjustment. Were these concerns of yours addressed? Because after a point you started attending the meetings again. See, addressed to some extent. So you have raised a lot of concerns about the health of the judiciary and the way it functions yes, as an institution. There are right things which require... Uh, uh, so which you have raised these issues. Yes. I was wondering what according to you the solutions are. It all depends on what issue you are talking about. See, let's say that the standard. If you want a one-line answer, is a solution sort of transparency. And whatever you, what are we talking about? Sitting on the bench, that uh, what was the great dictum of Justice Bhagavati? Every action of the government should be informed with reason. That's all I was also saying. Really, because it's a judicial office, it doesn't have different. Uh, it can't have different standards. It's a public office. If you expect the government and every officer of the government to take decisions in a, on a rational basis, on the judicial side, at least you give reasons what you are doing. Your reasons may be right or wrong, higher court may approve if you are sitting in the Supreme Court. Your appeal is uh, no more appeal, you are the last court. Whether you are infallible or not, you are final there. But lower courts, at least the reasons are given, recorded. There is a possibility of verifying. There is an appeal available. On the administrative side, there is no appeal available. So, therefore, uh, it requires to be, it requires a some amount of transport. transport. I'll, I'll uh, be a little more specific about that. Do you think the Supreme Court should function purely as a constitutional court? I believe so. And I already, more than once I mentioned it in uh, uh, public uh, fora. The so, you are a law graduate. Yeah. Uh, I'm no, sir. You are not a law graduate. I'm okay. Now that drop out. Yes, okay, sir. but you know something about law. I am sure you must be knowing about 138 Negotiable Instruments Act mm -hmm. proceedings. Mm -hmm. And you have any idea uh, uh, how many tiers of uh, scrutiny those matters go through? Yes, 
Was it the intention of the parliament when uh, it created an offence? Check bouncing is made an offence as late as in 1980s. Yes. Was it the idea behind uh, the legislation? The whole idea is civil suits take a long time. Criminal prosecution would uh, resolve the thing at an early date. And now what happens? For 20 years the matters are dragged on. Is it really necessary? Yes, sir, and uh, I will I'll tell you, I will tell you. Whenever uh, these matters came before me in the Supreme Court, and uh, even parties eventually they sense the mood of the judge, and they think that they are losing. Actually, the drawer of the check, if he, his lawyer is convinced that he is not going to succeed before the court, then he would immediately come forward with a you know, Lord, I'll, I'll go for a settlement. The lordship may kindly set aside the punishment part of it. I'll settle the amount. You know, sometimes with interest, sometimes with partial interest, or whatever it is. I used to insist, all right, you settle it wonderful out of it. But then you have wasted so much of judicial time. You compensate the system, make, make some additional payment, maybe some legal service authority or something like that. Because you are simply exploiting, the adv taking advantage of the system, the, appeal, uh, the number of appeals available. Is it really necessary that a 138 matter should go up? So what is the guarantee that the Supreme Court decision is right? If there were to be another appellate court, the parties would try it again. Why can't they end in the High Court? The Supreme Court in a federal system, in my view, should confine itself to the constitutional interpretation. In a letter which you addressed to the CGI, you mentioned the bonhomie between the executive and the judiciary, citing the example of uh, Justice Dinesh Maheshwari. Um, has this been the only time it happens? No, no, let us be fair to all the concerned. It's not the only time. There have always been instances in history, not only in this country, elsewhere also. Are there any other instances in India that you can cite, sir? Well, British on record, uh, Justice Goswami recorded, they were recollected Rajasthan uh, uh, present rule matter, state of Rajasthan versus dissolution of Main Street. Justice Goswami recorded that. Uh, the then acting president of India made a mention about the judgment to the Chief Justice of India, M. H. Baig. You remember that? Yeah. He recorded it. So the foot there were. So off late the executive seems to have a blatant disregard for orders passed by the judiciary. Is this a recent phenomenon or is this something which has always well, been happening? Whenever the executive had road roller majorities, it always happened. You have not seen seventies, I have seen seventies. The absolute majorities for the executive always uh, emboldened the executive to ride roughshod over the judicial process. It always happened. They aren't exactly riding roughshod. I'm talking about today's scenario, despite having a majority. The 70s is a completely diff different kettle of fish where the judiciary was uh, trampled upon. Uh, what's happening here in the current scenario seems to be that orders are being passed which are not being implemented. And nothing seems to be happening as a consequence of that. It did start today. See, I'll tell you a way of looking at it. Just think it over. In 1950s, just take uh, statistics. How many contempt cases were filed in Madras High Court, for example, to which uh, part of the present Andhra Pradesh was part of the jurisdiction? Or Bombay High Court, because they are chartered High Court, that's why I'm taking it. A collector high court, how many contempt petitions were filed? And take the statistics decade wise, and what is the current level of uh, the number of contempt cases per annum? There is a huge boom in contempt cases. Every contempt case is only signifies that the government is violating, and it government is uh, trying to violate or violating actually the orders of the court. So, therefore, it is not a recent phenomenon, it is it's, uh, it's always happened. Now, all of these complaints of contempt may not be justified. Some of them may be simply, you know, motivated or simply coerce the government to. But the very fact, at least, numbers are certainly increasing. So, given the fact that this government has an absolute majority and this violation or, or non implementation of orders is happening, isn't it time for the Supreme Court to put their foot down and do something about it? Is there something they can do? I don't ask the Supreme Court judges, I am a retired judge. What decision does it make? Whatever is my opinion. As a former judge, yes, if you care for the constitution, if an order of the 
highest court or for the matter high court or any court for that matter is not uh, honored it is doing violence to the constitution no government or any party for that many litigating party may believe that a particular regiment is not right the party is entitled including uh, government entitled to believe so but then question is is it an appealable order if it is an appealable order you believe uh, you test it carry it in appeal then convince the appellate court that the order is not uh, sustainable, not in accordance with law. Get it corrected. There is no difficulty. But if the order has become final, there is no constitutional justification for uh, ignoring the order. That would be the end of uh, constitutional governance. So the Supreme Court has historically maintained a sort of omata, at least as far as judges are concerned, in talking about the issues plaguing the judiciary while still in office. Uh, you were part of one such episode which broke this trend, so to speak. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I believe uh, silence is not an option when things are going wrong. I still believe so. Of course, there are a lot of people, a lot of vulnerable people who believed otherwise. Well, it's their opinion. I am entitled for my views. I suppose that's democracy. I am entitled for my views. It is for the the future generations to judge who is right, whose view is more sound, whose view is more beneficial to the people at large. So there is a sense that the Supreme Court is falling prey to sensationalism and giving priority to cases which are making the news and which are being debated in the public. For instance, the BCCI matter is one matter which comes to uh, mind. Do you think this is this sort of change? It is a partial truth. There is some justification for this accusation. I know as a matter of fact, as a matter of record, there are about, uh, at one point of time, there were about 50-55 references to constitutional bench pending. And right now, I didn't check up the latest figures, but I, I am sure even today there must be around 30-35 references to larger benches, 5, 7 and all. Those benches have not been, and then more uh, esoteric things take precedence over uh, these matters. So, so you wrote the dissenting judgment in the NJC case. Yes. Given the current attitude of the executive, you still stand by that order? I stand by every word of what I wrote. To decide the, cons the validity of a constitutional amendment is one thing. And to examine whether a particular decision pursuant to a constitutional provision is being taken in good faith or not is a different matter altogether. There can be complaints that a particular decision is not taken in good faith or not strictly in accordance with the stipulations of the law. That doesn't mean the law is bad. The implementation of the law is bad. I, I stand by every word of what I wrote in NJSC matter. That does not mean that the government can uh, ride roughshod over uh, the whole system. Given the existing laws, do you ever see a judge of a constitutional court being impeached in this country? It has nothing to do with the law. It is nothing. To, it has something to do with the people who operate the system. And to put it on a lighter way, yesterday I received a WhatsApp message. If you are weighing a hundred kgs, you would weigh only sixty-four kgs on Mars and sixteen kgs on Moon. So don't think that you are obese. The only thing is you are on the wrong planet. Change the planet. Well, it's a bit given our parliamentary system. Uh, do you, do you see that's that? how democracies work. Hey, you get a system which you deserve. The level of the maturity of the players in the system. So do you think the immunity afforded to judges uh, as per the Veera Swami judgment should be stripped? No, I don't believe. Because you look at the thing. If that immunity is not there, lot of frivolous complaints would come. The no judge will be able to perform his duties. That in a particular case that uh, Vira Swami's judgment was wrongly applied or uh, ignored there is no justification for getting over. Look at the danger the other way around. Especially the executive, political executive, but is not happy with the judge, then it can create uh, any amount of trouble. But nowadays some lawyers, um, Mr. Shanti Bhushan for example, 
they've come out openly against the courts and the judgments and against individual judges as well. And I see a lot of traffic on social media where there are sometimes even abusive posts about individual judges in their You're judgments. Telling me? The kind of abuse which I have received in the last six months, I don't know whether you have read it, I read a lot of it. <laughs> so my point is, but contempt proceedings are not being initiated against people like this. H how and why has this changed? Uh, uh, the, some time ago, a judge initiated contempt proceedings against someone because a train ticket was in book. Ultimately, sometime back it didn't happen or now it is happening. In fact, I am uh, one of the two judges who struck down the 66 year. Though the regiment was actually written by Brother Nariman, I presided over that bench and then of course in between us we agreed that he would write it and I signed. I agreed with him. This is the information technology. Right? Information technology. Yes. That's, that's what is protecting all these people today, all those people who abuse me on the internet. But uh, I always looked at the notwithstanding some abuse of the free liberty, that freedom of speech is essential for the survival of a democracy. It's a very minor price which we pay for retaining yes. our larger liberties. There's a very famous uh, anecdote. When Cromwell was the Lord Protector, some scurrilous material was published against him. So some friend brought it to his notice and uh, advised him to take action against the man and uh, prohibit the, proscribe this. Cromwell was supposed to have said, uh, if my government is here to stay, I have nothing to worry about, a paper shot. Let him have the paper, I'll have the government. So, I think that's the right attitude, healthy attitude in a democracy. Well, if somebody wants to abuse, let him abuse. What is that? What is going to happen? <laughs> if people abuse me, somebody carried on a relentless campaign for the last six months attributing all kinds of motives behind my press conference. I still get my pension. I completed my tenure. And there are a lot of people who still respect me in this country. Well, somebody abuses, abuses. Well, it's his life liberty. Majesty I have taken over to protect his liberty, I protect it. The majesty of the court is in some way being lessened. For instance, I don't think it would, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something. Majesty of the court depends upon the quality of the service it renders to the people. If, see, majesty of the court depends upon the quality of the people who man it. If a good number of the, a good section of the society, a good number of the people in the society believe what I have done is right, it only added to the majesty of the court. If, on the other hand, if a good number of the people believe that I did not do the right thing, yes, it would uh, dent the majesty of the court. Now, what what a good number of people are thinking about it, it's for you to make an assessment. I don't know. I believe, see, so far as I am concerned, as an actor, I went by the dictates of my conscience. I performed my duty. Are you in favor of increasing the retirement age for High Court and Supreme Court judges? One way it is good actually, provided uh, they continue to be of uh, some utility to the system. See, insofar as subordinate judges are concerned, members of the subordinate judiciary, and the judgment of the Supreme Court, an assessment is required to be made uh, periodically 50, 55, and 58, whether they should be continued in the service or compulsorily retired. And the assessment, the test is of their continued utility to the system. If that kind of a assessment is made, well. A lot of people talk about pendency. Mm. But don't you think pendency is attributable to the fact that most important issues seems to seem to have judgments supporting both arguments? That's what happens with a polyvocal Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sits in bank in every case. Is this problem, there can be a, there are various other factors which contribute to this pendency. There is only one factor. This factor can be handled uh, by this. You simply have uh, only the Supreme Court uh, dealing only with constitutional matters. But this doesn't simply, uh, this is not something which is restricted to the Supreme Court itself. It happens in the high courts as well, despite the fact that precedents might exist which are cited before them. Right. What does the system has to hand? That's why I said references to larger uh, benches are not taken up for uh, decades. That leads to all confusion. See, for example, I'll give you one example. There is an issue about uh, mineral rights taxation. Remember uh, the India Cement Judgment of 1990, Savasaj Mukherjee's. There's a series of judgments dealing with the authority of the parliament to deal with the matter, the authority of the state legislature to deal with this matter. 
I from 1961 onwards, uh, Hinger, Rampur and company, Bajana, the India Summons, uh, Varisa Summons, there were all kinds of uh, series of judgments. Yet the issue is still live. A reference was made a few years back to a larger range of nine judges. Supreme Court could not take up the matter so far. And actually, all these judgments create enough confusion. Well, it's a last paradise. You can argue the case either way because for either way there are judgments supporting the argument. So it is. These issues are required to be. Set. And then uh, this, particularly this particular issue, which have, it has huge economic implications for this nation, for the states, their authority to collect the tax or their lack of authority to collect the tax. These are all serious questions. I, I don't know whether it is really why is judicial policy to keep these matters pending that long. Mr. Chalmeshwar, thank you very much for speaking with Barin Bench. It's been a real pleasure, sir.